Good morning, church. Being able to connect to God is important. God has given us the gift of prayer so that we can have conversations with him. And yet we sometimes have a hard time implementing prayer and living it out in our daily lives. For some of us, prayer is a tool that we only utilize when our life circumstance becomes desperate. Some folks may feel intimidated by prayer, worrying that they'll do it wrong. Others may find prayer boring, thinking that it's a one-way conversation. They do an awful lot of talking to hear nothing back. Our schedules get busy, and we spend so much time connecting to others, and we just sometimes plain forget to connect with God. If we're honest about it, we know that prayer is important, but sometimes we just don't feel like praying. We are incredibly connected people, especially with all of the innovations in the technology field. And in all of our connectedness, the most important connection we have is our connection with God. So this series, this wireless series, is going to help us to reclaim this essential spiritual discipline. It might give us a better understanding of the true nature of prayer and help us to make prayer a part of our daily lives so that we can make sure we don't lose our connection with God. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of James chapter 1. And in the opening of his letter, James calls himself a bond servant of God, an appropriate name given the practical servant-oriented emphasis of the book. And throughout the book, James contended that faith produces authentic deeds. In other words, if people who call themselves God's people truly belong to him, their lives will produce deeds or fruit. In language and themes that sound familiar to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, James rails against the hypocritical believer who says one thing but does another. We'll look at verses 19 through 27. Hear these words. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they look like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere, being not hearers who forget but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The book of James looks a bit like the Old Testament book of Proverbs dressed up in New Testament clothes. Its consistent focus on practical action in the life of faith is reminiscent of the wisdom literature in the Old Testament, encouraging God's people to act like God's people. The pages of James are filled with practical and direct commands to pursue a life of holiness. And he makes no excuses for those who do not measure up. In the mind of this early church leader, Christians evidence their faith by walking in certain ways and not walking in others. And for James, a faith that does not produce real life change is a faith that does not have much worth. For James, faith was not this abstract proposition, but it rather had real effects in the world. James offered numerous practical examples to illustrate his point, saying that faith endures in the midst of trials. It calls on God for wisdom. It bridles the tongue. It sets aside wickedness. It visits the widows and orphans and does not play favorites. He stressed that the life of faith is comprehensive 
impacting every area of our lives and driving us to truly engage in the lives of other people all around the world. While James recognized that even believers stumble, he also knew that faith could not coexist with people who roll their eyes at the homeless and the less fortunate, people who ignore the plight of others or curse those who get in their way. More than any other book in the New Testament, James places the spotlight on the necessity for believers to act in accordance with the faith they proclaim. How well do your actions mirror the faith you profess? This is a question that sometimes we struggle to answer well. Because when we start thinking about it, we'd like to point to all the ways our faith and our work overlap. But all too often, we only see gaps and crevices. As we grow in Christian faith, James calls us to focus on these areas that he has mentioned. Our actions during trials, our treatment of those less fortunate, the way we speak and relate to others and the role that money plays in our lives. And he encourages us to do good according to the faith we proclaim. James is calling for more than an intersection between faith and daily life. He's calling for the two to walk together hand in hand. And to do that, we have to be conformed into the image and the mind and the will of God. And aside from reading scripture, one of the best ways that we grow closer to God is through prayer. And it makes sense. If we want to grow closer to God, then it would follow that we need to talk to God. And when we talk to God, we deepen our relationship with God. And when we deepen our relationship with God, we come to understand more of what he expects from us, we have to be willing to learn about God. We have to be willing to talk with God and to share openly with him about what's going on in our lives. We have to dial in. Now, in today's world, this idea of dialing in or connecting is nothing novel. We live in this age of constant connection. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and other social media outlets give us the opportunity to stay connected with friends who live miles away from us. We can celebrate engagements and weddings, new births and new homes, new careers. We can pray with people who are dealing with a health crisis or who lost a loved one. On the downside, all of this new technology has led to a new wave of bullying. And quite honestly, we really don't need to know that someone just took the best shower ever. And if folks could please stop with the pictures of foot injuries or feet in general, my world would be a much happier place. In case you weren't aware, I don't like feet. Technology has also gifted us with Skype and FaceTime. Now we don't only talk to people on the phone or via text message, but we can actually have a face-to-face conversation with folks who are nowhere near us. A few weeks ago, when Nora Sparks was baptized, some of her family members couldn't be here. And Kirsten's sister sat right up front in the front row and FaceTimed those family members into our worship service. That's cool stuff. Military families can now see loved ones who are deployed domestically and abroad. It's a game changer. And yet, with all of this connectedness, many of us leave little or no room for our relationship with God. All of the connections being built through technology, they're a great thing But there are detriments because in some cases, these are becoming a substitute for real, authentic human relationships. And it certainly adds to the amount of information we consume on a daily basis, creating noise that blocks other things out. It's tempting for us to pull up Facebook feeds or to check a text message during a meeting. And I began to wonder if the continual buzzing and dinging of messaging alerts that interrupt our interactions with one another could also be interrupting and interfering in our connection with God. If we are to be doers of God's word and God's will, and as we're praying and as we're reading, we're clicking away and checking our phone every few seconds to check a news feed or a message, how much of God are we actually taking in? In an age of wireless phones, one of the most frustrating things can be a weak signal or a dropped call. In fact, I just called a customer service line the other day and they said, in case the call gets dropped, what's the best number 
to reach you. Aside from the noise of our connected world, we also experience weak data connections, dropped Wi-Fi or limited cell service, and these weak signals, they frustrate us. The same could be said with our relationship with God. One of the most common complaints I hear about people when they talk to me about their prayer life is that they feel like they're experiencing this weak signal. And this observation is usually followed by one of two conclusions. They say either that they feel like they must be doing something wrong or that God just doesn't care. As a result, some people kind of grow into using prayer like a fire hydrant. It's only there in case of emergencies. But remember, as we talked early in the year, doing this just simply makes God a vending machine. I mean, we put in our prayer and we expect the desired outcome back, but it just doesn't work that way. I can safely say that our weak signals are not a result of God's not caring, period, in. And I would also say that while the content of our prayers might be part of the problem, I think the bigger issue when it comes to our not doing something right is that we allow too many interruptions and too much noise to get in the way and to creep into our time with God. We make excuses that life is too busy or that prayer is intimidating or, again, to be completely honest with ourselves, sometimes we just find it boring. I mean, we have this image that prayer requires bowed heads and closed eyes or that it means circles of people holding hands and us hoping not to be next to the person that squeezes too much or has sweaty palms. And even our excuses and our ideas become noise that get in the way. Most simply, prayer is a conversation with God. And in a true, real, and honest conversation, both parties speak and both parties listen. Yeah, prayer can be done in a circle holding hands. Prayer can be done with eyes closed and heads bowed. But prayers can also be lifted up as we drive. Prayers can be lifted as we take a walk in our neighborhood praying for each house that we pass. Prayers can be said in the grocery store aisles as we're passing by other shoppers. Prayer can be boring if we're not expecting anything back out of it. And prayer can be intimidating if we're fearful that there's something that we're holding on to that's making us unworthy of going before God in prayer. We'll talk more about finding words and about outcomes from prayer in the next couple of weeks, but today is simply a test to establish a strong connection. So I wanna give us some troubleshooting tips that we can work on this week that might help restore our connection with God as we go further and deeper into this series. Troubleshooting tip number one, confess your sin. Sin is one of the greatest disruptors in our connection with God because the very definition of sin is a separation from God. Unconfessed sin is like noise that drowns out whatever it is that God is trying to say to us. When we confess sin, we get rid of interference. We get rid of the noise. God isn't creating the noise, the static The prophet Isaiah tells us in in, in chapter 59, verse 1 through 2, he says, See, the Lord's hand is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he doesn't hear. See, the problem is not God's hearing. The problem is the iniquities that disrupt our signal. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but... He hears the prayer of the righteous. Some of us have sin on the calendar. We're praying to God, seeking forgiveness for something we've done, and yet while we're praying, we know that there's something ahead and about an hour that's going to throw us right back into sin. Stuff like this kills our connection with God. To establish that secure connection with God, we simply need to ask, God, what is it? What is it that's between you and me that we need to get cleared up And once you figure out what that is, repent and ask God for forgiveness and be sure to include the stuff that's in an hour or two that's on that calendar. Troubleshooting tip number two, we need to forgive. The word most commonly linked with prayer in the Bible is the word forgiveness. We think that we can have relational problems on earth and that they won't affect our relationship with God or our spiritual lives, but that's wrong. Our relationships have a direct impact on our spiritual lives because we were created as relational beings. In Mark eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, whenever you stand praying, forgive, 
Do you have anything against anyone? So that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Ask yourself, is there someone I need to forgive? And then pray, God, you have forgiven me, so I am going to forgive. Troubleshooting tip number three, care for the needy. The Israelites accused God of not listening to them. They were frustrated. They said, we're practicing our piety, and God, you are ignoring us. And in chapter 58, they questioned God, why have you not heard us? We're fasting. They humbled themselves, but to no avail. And God responded, telling them that they were fasting and humbling themselves only out of their own self-interest. And in verses 5 through 6, God fires back. He says, is this not the fast I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? You see, God doesn't want fasting and humility just for the sake of our desire to prove something to God. God wants fasting and humility so that through our fasting and through our humility, we turn ourselves and our lives towards those who hunger and those who are marginalized. Proverbs 21.13 says, If you close your ear to the cry of the poor, you will cry out and not be heard. Sometimes we see someone struggling and we pray to God, God, please send someone to help them. What if that someone is you? Are we helping someone in need? We often get so wrapped up in our own worlds that we don't see the needs of others around us. And if we're too self-absorbed and not other-focused, God said that our prayers might as well fall on deaf ears. Troubleshooting tip number four, be still and listen. We want God to speak in some magical way, but often we see in Scripture that God speaks to us when we're silent. Psalm 46, verse 10, the first part says, Be still and know that I am God. One of the best and simplest definitions of being still that I've encountered is that we are silent on the outside and surrendered on the inside. Think about that. What have we found time every single day to be silent on the outside while inside we surrendered ourselves to God's will. As I said earlier, prayer is a conversation with God and conversations are two-sided. It's not a matter of searching for an audible voice, but pray as you read scripture and don't walk with your head glued to the screen of your smartphone. Rather, ask God to open your eyes as you look at the world around you, wherever you are, and ask God, what is it in this moment that you want me to see? Ask God to use others and to use Scripture to speak to you the words that God wants you to hear. Be still. Troubleshooting tip number five, become a Christian. Now, I know that may sound obvious, but prayer is a privilege based on the relationship we each have with Jesus Christ. Jesus said he's the way to the Father. So if we haven't established and entered that relationship, prayer will no doubt be a difficult thing. My mentor for the ordination process was Pastor Brian Harkness, and he served in the West Ohio Conference as an elder for a number of years, and his current appointment is a church plant in Hebron, Ohio, just south of where I grew up. And I attended on a, on a Sunday that I had off. I went to worship at his church, New Life Community United Methodist Church. And when it came time for the pastoral prayer, Brian invited people to join him up front at the altar for prayer. I was captivated by the idea. So I started, when I started at Madison Mills, I started doing it every week and then at Jeffersonville, and I've been strongly desiring to resume this practice here at Mount Moriah. See, each of us has access to God, and each week we have the opportunity and the right to lay our burdens down at his feet or to offer him praise for our joys. So starting next week, I will be inviting anyone who would like to come forward to pray to do so during the call to prayer. This is going to become an every week thing for us. I'll come down and I'll kneel on the steps, and if I'm the only one, so be it. If I'm not... So be it. If you have a sin and you want to come, you can. Confess it. 
If you have a need to forgive, petition God for the strength. If you need help opening your eyes to the needies, the needy folks, ask for it. If you're having trouble canceling out the noise, just come and be still. If you need Christ in your life, invite him into your heart. If you can kneel, kneel. If you need to sit, sit in the front row. If you need to stand, stand. Don't worry about coming or what your neighbor's going to think. It's not what this is about. It's just about coming and knowing that you've got access to God the Father and you can spend some quality time with him. This is one of the great gifts of the church and of worship is that we have this space away from all the noise of the world to connect with God. And I want to create that opportunity for us each and every week. So today, I'm going to make that offer to you as we close this time in prayer. In a moment, I'm going to come down, I'm going to kneel, and I'm going to pray. And you're welcome to come and pray if you would like. And if I say amen and you're not done, stay here while the rest of us sing. If God is calling to your heart today, come before him. Listen for what he might be saying to you. Make the call. God is ready to listen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have for talking to you in this moment. We thank you that a way has been made that we can talk to you about what is going on in our lives. Help us not to complicate things or get lost in some magic formula, but simply to talk to you. Speak to us in our silence and help us to have hearts and minds that are ready to listen. This we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Confess your sin. Forgive others or ask forgiveness for yourself. Care for the needy. Be still. Become a Christian. If you've got a weak signal with God, try one or all of these troubleshooting tips and restore that connection so that as we go deeper into this series, you might find yourself entering into a deep and very rewarding prayer life with God. And may God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and be with you always. If you would like someone to pray with you this morning, our Hope Prayer servants will be up front after the service. Do not hesitate to come forward. They'd be happy to pray with you. We'll see you next week.